Today, we are the talk, the sermon, will point out the nature of Jesus, his divine nature and his human nature. The two natures, but in one person. We base all our saying, our teaching, on the Holy Scripture, on the Bible. We know that God told Adam and Eve that the serpent who had deceived Eve will be punished. He will try to attack the child which would be born of the Blessed Mother. Of course, uh, the Holy Scripture doesn't tell us the Holy Mother by name, but she tells us, and she told the serpent, and he told the serpent, that her seed will destroy the serpent. The serpent representing the devil. And then all through Holy Scriptures, we hear how God called Abraham, telling him, come, I tell you where to go, because out of you will be born my beloved son, the Messiah. Now it was all very difficult to understand for Abraham, because he was an old man, his wife, Sarah, was an old woman, so he couldn't understand how it would be possible that the son born of that woman would be the Messiah. But Abraham put all the faith in the words of God. He did not doubt. He left his father's house. He went into the direction that God chose him not knowing where he was going, but full of faith, he knew that God will show him where he has to go, what land God had destined for him and for his own people. We, saw, we see, therefore, Abraham going on the way and on the way meeting three persons. He adored the three persons because he perceived that that was God. The two other persons were angels. Abraham saw three, but he adored one. And that was, therefore, to be the descendant of Abraham. At the same time, we know from Holy Scripture that when the word Messiah is mentioned, it is always the promised person that God would send on the world to redeem the world. Now, who could redeem the world? Don't forget that after the fall of Adam and Eve, the friendship between man and God had been destroyed. So who could now bring back that friendship? The offense was against God, because every sin that we commit is against God, is against the goodness of God. And therefore, it was necessary that the person who would destroy the curse the punishment and bring humanity as friends, friends of God would have to be a divine person. Now we know that God, who is goodness itself, as we say in the creed about the Son of God, that he was begotten, not made. He is of the same nature, of the same substance as God, equal to God the Father. And therefore, it shows us that Jesus, 
who is called the Son of God, is equal to God in all respects. Therefore, he is divine. But because he had to come into this world to renew the friendship that had been lost, he had to put on a humanity without destroying the divine nature that he had. And that's why in the creed we say, consubstantial of the same substance, of the same nature, equal to the Father. And then we know that all through Holy Scripture, we speak of the Messiah, the promised one, as being the Son of God. And being the Son of God, of the same substance and the same nature, he is divine. Now, how did God show his divinity? Again, we are all basing everything on the Holy Scripture, on the Bible. God called Moses, who had been in Egypt as a slave. God told him, I have chosen you to free the people, my people, Israel, from the slavery of Egypt. Moses, therefore, was a figure of Jesus, the Savior. Moses, at first, kind of refused. He said, who am I to go to the Pharaoh and telling him that you want the people of Israel who were slaves, of course, to leave Egypt and to go into the land that I had promised to Abraham. As I said, Moses at first refused. He said, when I tell the Pharaoh that you commanded me, he will ask me, what is the name of your God? God told him, Tell him that I am who am, who in our language, more or less, we translate it to Yahweh, but it means I am who am. So Moses believed God, went to the Pharaoh, and told him the message that God wanted. Now, as I said, Moses was a kind of a representative of Jesus, who after so many hundreds, thousands of years, would come into the world. But it was always therefore spoken about that Jesus, the Savior of mankind, would come with all power given to him by God, and therefore, as with the divinity of God, and at the same time with the humanity of man. Because that is how God uses his instruments. Very often it is under two figures. The same person, but under two missions. And that is therefore, Jesus came into the world as a divine person. And in his speech, in his teaching, Jesus always claimed that he was the Son of God. When people objected, how can this person, being the Son, by the estimate of the people who were listening to him, being the son of Joseph, being the son of Mary, how can he claim to be the son of God? And you remember the miracle that while Jesus was preaching, they brought to him a man who was a paralytic, paralyzed, who had never walked, but who always was lying down on a mat, not able to move. When Jesus saw him, he told him, 
against the expectation of the people, your sins are forgiven. The people were scandalized. They said, how can this man, this rabbi, tell this paralytic, your, your sins are forgiven? Because, again, as we believe ourselves, it is only God that can forgive sins. And Jesus, therefore, knowing about the complaint of these people, told them, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or if I say to this man, to this paralytic, get up, take your mat, meaning your bed, portable bed, and walk. Jesus, looking at the man, gave the command, telling him, get up and go. And therefore Jesus was showing that what he was saying and what he was doing was an act of the divinity. It was hard for the people to understand because it was beyond their concept, their understanding, how God could come into this world under the figure of a person, of a human being. Of course, we cannot blame them for their disbelief if we take it only from the human point of view. We know that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the Blessed Mother could not really understand the mystery of the Incarnation. Going a little back, we know that nine months before the birth of Jesus, the angel had appeared to the Blessed Mother telling her, you are going to be the mother of the Messiah. The Blessed Mother, in all humility, told him, how can I be the mother of the Messiah since I am a virgin? I have had no relations with any man. The angel assured her that what was going to happen in her was all by the power of the divinity, that God was going to overshadow her and she would bring forth this son, her son, who would be the Messiah. Then we see them going to the temple to fulfill the command that Moses had given, that uh, the child had to go to the temple, the mother to thank God for the fruit of her womb, and the child to be consecrated to God. So we can see, we can imagine how the Blessed Mother felt more or less confused. The angel told her that this child is the promised one from all the history of human, of human history. And yet, here he was now, offering himself through his mother, through Mary and Joseph, to God. The Blessed Mother believed, but she could not understand the mystery. But in her humility, she accepted what the prophet Simeon told her. This child is the promised one from the beginning since the fall of our first parents. He will be called the Son of God because that is what he is. Mary, in all humility, accepted the saying, the teaching of Simeon. But all, all the same, it was a great mystery. And Simeon, prophesying, foretelling what this child was going to be and what he was going to fulfill the missions that had been proph prophesied from the beginning. The Holy Gospel tells us 
and Mary listened to the teaching of Simeon, she could not, as I said, she could not understand, but she kept everything in her heart, in her memory, trying to work out the mystery of salvation. Then we see, again, to the confusion of the Blessed Mother, Saint Joseph, her protector, told her that in a vision he was told that he has to take her and the child into Egypt. Now we can understand the worry of the Blessed Mother. How can we go to Egypt with this little baby? But overcome, overcoming all the worry, she followed Saint Joseph and went into Egypt. Because the angel had told Saint Joseph that the king, Herod, would be looking to kill the child. So again, from our human reason, we say, if Jesus was the promised Messiah, if he was the Son of God, why should he be forced to flee into Egypt? But all this human consideration was put aside. They obeyed both Saint Joseph, the Blessed Mother, and of course, the child Jesus, they went into Egypt. And of course, we have to remember that it was not an easy journey. After about seven years, the angel again appeared to Joseph. Take the child and his mother. By this time, Jesus was about seven years old. Go back into your country, into your city, because those who were trying to kill the child have died. Again, therefore, they took the journey up to Nazareth. Now, the destination was Bethlehem. But of course, the angel told him, no, you would not go to Bethlehem, you go to Nazareth. Because Jesus would be called a Nazarene. A Nazarene was a person consecrated to God because his mission was to spread the good news of salvation. And then following the prophecies, especially of Isaiah, who speaks of the suffering and death of Jesus. Now, the Blessed Mother, keeping all this in her mind, how this child growing up would be the Redeemer of mankind. Because that is what the prophecy of Isaiah had, had said, that Jesus, this promised messenger of God, who is himself God, the second person of the most blessed trinity, would free his people. Would free, therefore, each one of us, because we are all people of God, children of God. And as Jesus was growing again, showing his divinity in a more or less hidden way, we hear the Gospel telling us that when he was 12, he went with his parents, with the Blessed Mother and Saint Joseph, to the temple. After fulfilling all that was prescribed by the law of Moses, the Blessed Mother and Saint Joseph were heading back home. But Jesus was not with them. Jesus remained in the temple. And the Holy Gospel tells us that after three days, they found him in the midst of the doctors of the people, 
doctors of the church, of the people of God, asking them questions and replying to their objections. But they wondered and said, this young f boy, how did he get all this knowledge? They admired him. And of course, they did not, they had not yet received the knowledge that this was the Messiah. The Holy Gospel tells us that Jesus went with his parents, Mary and Joseph, back to Nazareth. Jesus was growing up and naturally preaching and telling the people what the message of God was for them. Every Saturday, he used to go to the synagogue, as now, of course, he was a young man, teaching things that the people had never heard before, speaking to them with authority. They challenged him, and they said, where did this young man, this young rabbi, get all his knowledge? He is the son of Joseph, a carpenter, Mary, and so far as the people were concerned, an ordinary woman having to carry water from the well, from the fountain to her house. So how could this young man have this knowledge? Jesus, again, through his teaching, was asserting that though they were seeing a young man, a young, a young rabbi, yet he was the Son of God. And this brings us, therefore, to the marriage at Cana in Galilee. Jesus, and by this time, he had some friends whom we call the apostles, followed him, they were at the wedding feast, and then the Blessed Mother noticed that they were short of wine. She turns to Jesus and telling him, they have no wine. Now this again, it was difficult for the Blessed Mother, in a way, in a human way of speaking, what am I? Who am I to interfere with this, my child, whom I don't always understand? Because the Blessed Mother, although she was the mother of Jesus, she did not understand fully the prophecies. But all the same, she told Jesus, they have no wine. Jesus at first gave a reply which we would not expect. My hour has not yet come. But at the same time, the Blessed Mother tells the servants, do what he tells you. And now Jesus, kind of from the human point of view, put aside his human will and telling them, fill the jars with water. And we know how he worked that miracle. In other words, he was exercising now his divine power so that the man in charge, the caretaker, who did not know where that wine came from, wondered and called the groom, how is it that you kept this good wine so late in the party. And it continued like that. Jesus continued to preach, going from one town to the other, people willing to accept his teaching, but sometimes with difficulty. But because he worked miracles, they overcame the doubts that they had, and they followed him. And we see, again, always in the scripture, to show the divinity of Jesus, 
Jesus sometimes gave some kind of freedom to his followers, the apostles. They went one way and he went the other way. And we remember that on one day, Jesus came to the shore of the lake Genezaret and he saw these fellow followers, the apostles, coming in their boat, rather sulky. Jesus prevent, presented himself, telling them, why are you sulky? Throw the nets on the lake and you will catch a fish. Now the apostles had already kind of followed Jesus with faith. But at the same time, don't forget, the apostles were older than Jesus in years. So, like Peter told him, Rabbi, we have worked all night and caught nothing. But since you tell me that I should throw the nets into the sea, into the water, I do it. And we know what happened, the multiplication of the fish. And it was so big that they had to call their friends. In that case, it was John and James, children of Zebedee, to come to help them to pull up the net on land. Of course, it was all mysterious. How is it that we tried all night and got nothing and that the word of this rabbi, we now have the boats almost sinking with the weight of the fish. So in other words, Jesus was preparing his apostles to accept him as the divine master as the promised Messiah. From the human point of view, of course, this was not easy. Because even if we were there, we would say, what about this rabbi? How can he assert, how can he work miracles in this way to win the confidence of the people? Some believed, others were doubtful. Then in his teaching, Jesus was very strict in telling the doctrine that had to be accepted if they really wanted to be his followers. Some tempting him asked him, how can you assert this? And at one time, even quoting Moses, that the law of Moses permitted certain things uh, uh, which Jesus was telling them it could not be done. This was the question of divorce. Jesus told them that when Moses gave them that permission, it was because of the hardness of their heart. But in the beginning, it was not like that. What God had united, no person, no human being could destroy. People found it very hard. And many left him. And then Jesus turning to the disciples, telling them, why don't you leave as well? If my doctrine is too hard for you to believe. Saint Peter, now, in the name of his friends, the apostles, told him, we know, we believe that your words are from God. And therefore, we will stick with you. We might find the doctrine very strict, very hard to believe, but we believe in you. And we know how the apostles continued to follow Jesus, listening to him. And then the apostles, 
I have prayed, I have wanted to be with you, to say this goodbye to you, because it is time for me to go and fulfill my mission of dying for mankind. Again, we find the apostles difficult to understand. How can the Messiah, the deliverer of the people of God, and of course, in the teaching of Jesus, the deliverer of mankind from the power of the devil to bring them back as children of God, following the teaching of God. And we see him at the Last Supper telling the apostles, go and teach all nations. Follow the teaching that I have given you. So this was kind of a contradiction. This rabbi is sending us to preach while at the same time he is foretelling something terrible that was going to happen. That he would be imprisoned, that he would be beaten up, that he would die. And this brings us therefore to the Last Supper. Jesus wanted to show the apostles what the Last Supper was meant to be. Uh, that is to say, the purity of the person who partakes of this miracle of changing the bread and the wine into his body and blood. First, to begin the service, Jesus wanted them to show them the purity by washing their feet. Don't forget, it was necessary, and even in the law of Moses, that when they came from a journey, their feet had to be washed. But the apostles had already accepted Jesus as the Messiah. How, how could Jesus wash the feet of his apostles? And we hear Peter telling him, no, you will never wash my feet. Jesus telling him, if I don't wash you clean, you cannot be my disciple. And then we hear Saint Peter telling him, not only my feet, but wash my hands, my head. I want to be as clean as you want me to be. Jesus answered, I know that you have believed in me, that you don't need more washing, more purification than I want to show you by my humility in washing your feet. Now, going back in, in the history, Jesus was preaching. He was telling the people, therefore, the message of God. And he, from the human point of view, wanted to make sure that his apostles really accepted him. And he asked a difficult question, telling them, whom do the people say that I am? Who, I, who am I? The apostles, although they believed in him as the Messiah, were somewhat confused. And some said, well, people say that you are John the Baptist came, who came back to life. Others said, we believe that you are Elijah who had come back from God. And everyone was expressing his opinion. Jesus naturally was not satisfied and he challenges them. Who do you say that I am. Now Peter, who always played the part of the leader of his friends, the apostles, told him, we believe that you are the anointed one of God. 
that you are the Messiah, that you have been sent, therefore, to this world to bring people back to the friendship of God. Jesus now pronounced the wonderful sentence telling him, your profession of faith does not come from human beings, but it is an inspiration from God. In other words, Jesus was professing that he is the Messiah, that he is the messenger of God, the savior of mankind. And it was in these instances, therefore, that Jesus claimed that he was the savior of mankind, that indeed he would die, but on the third day he will rise again. Again, the apostles, although believed in Jesus, could not understand how a person from dead could come back to life. However, we know that at the resurrection, when Jesus rose from the dead, appearing to the apostles, they were frightened. They were thinking that they were seeing a phantom, a ghost. Jesus assures them, no, I am a true person. It is true, in other words, that I am the Messiah, but at the same time, I am a human person. And he asked them to give him something to eat. In other words, showing them that he was a real and a true human being. Then, when the time had come, after 40 days, he told them, it is time for me to go to my father. I had been sent here as the Messiah. I am the second person of the most blessed Trinity. But it is time for me, therefore, that as I have fulfilled my mission on earth, I have to go back to the Father. And we know how he told them, all power has been given to me because I am the Son of God, because I am the Messiah. Go all over the world, teaching, giving the message of salvation to all the people and assuring them that if they believe my teaching, if they fulfill my commandments, they will be with me for all eternity. And we know how the apostles, frightened, yet believing what Jesus has told them. Jesus was taken up to heaven by his own power of, of the divinity. You see, we speak of the Blessed Mother going to heaven, but she was taken to heaven, while Jesus showed them that he was going to heaven by his own power. And this, therefore, Jesus telling them, go, in this case to Jerusalem, pray, because after some days, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, will remind you of all my teaching, will give you all the strength to resist all those who oppose you, not by sword, but by faith, by my teaching. And we know that after 10 days of their praying, together with the Blessed Mother, they were praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit came on them, they became changed persons. Persons who were afraid of nothing. They knew that they would be arrested, that they would be put to death. But the Holy Spirit had given them all the strength that they needed to continue the mission that Jesus confided in them. And this, therefore, it shows us that Jesus, though he was 
the Son of God, that although he was divine, at the same time, he was a human being. Because he used words and deeds which make a person like us what we are. And therefore, this is what we confess when we say the creed that we believe, we believe in Jesus as the Messiah of the same nature, of the same essence of the Father. And through our faith, therefore, we obey the teaching of Jesus. Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.